Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of Super Deep Movie Analysis. I'm actor and screenwriter Lex Zorn, and in this episode I'll be super deep analyzing one of the two movies that got me to go into film. In the early years of my marriage, my wife, who's of Indian descent, often borrowed Indian movies, in other words, Bollywood movies, from a nearby public library. One day while we were there, I browsed the foreign DVD section out of curiosity. The bulk of those DVDs were Indian, but there were a few exceptions, including one from, of all places, Iceland. Because I love Nordic culture being a Swedish American, and because I'm fascinated by isolated cultures, I borrowed the DVD, and it literally ended up changing my life. The English title of the DVD is Noi, and the native title is Noi Albinoi, uh, which translates to Noi the Albino. Now, I probably mispronounced the title, and I'll probably mispronounce many of the names of the actors and characters in this movie, so I apologize in advance. Noi is a fascinating drama that's both a character study and a portrayal of life in a remote section of one of the most isolated countries in the world. The movie focuses on a highly enigmatic high school student named Noi, played by Thomas Le Marquis, who resides in a small town that seems to be very far away from Reykjavik, Iceland's capital and only major city. Noi stands out in a crowd by being bald, tall, and pale, and he also attracts a lot of attention because of his behavior. The movie opens with its title sequence showing Noi standing inside his living room with the door open as he shovels a pile of snow that's almost as tall as he is. Meanwhile, his paternal grandmother, Lena, played by Anna Friedrichsdotter, um, is shown pouring a bucket of ice into the sink and then starting to melt it. That does a great job establishing, establishing the environment in which the characters live, and the next scene begins to establish the title character. Noi is sleeping when he should be getting up for school, and after Lena tries to calmly wake him up, she retrieves a rifle and fires a shot through the open window of Noi's room, which does the trick. While he's eating breakfast, his father Kitty, played by Torster Leo Gunnarsson, arrives to take Noi to school. Kitty is an alcoholic taxi driver who lives nearby and sees his son regularly, but hasn't played a big part in raising him. Noi's mother and paternal grandfather are never mentioned, though, it's, though a deleted scene reveals that Noi's paternal grandfather is dead. While driving Noi to, sc to school, Kitty expresses concern to Noi about his poor attendance habits at school, which Ki Kitty was recently informed about through a letter, but Noi seems unconcerned. Upon arriving at school, he walks into class late. The teacher, Alfred, played by Gudmunder Olafsson, sarcastically suggests that Noi might be better suited for evening school or correspondence school. Noi asks what's going on, and Alfred says that they're having a math exam, then asks Noi if they forgot to send him an invitation. Noi borrows a pencil, signs his name, and turns in the exam without answering any of the questions. Alfred is shocked and asks Noi what grade he expects to receive. Noi cheerfully says zero, but Alfred informs Noi that he'll get a 0 0.5 for signing his name, to which Noi says again cheerfully, that's better than he expected. In another early scene, Noi is sleeping in French class when the principal, Torr, in played by Torstein Gunnarsson, arrives to take Noi to see a psychiatrist who's visiting the school. Torr, in asks the French teacher if Noi is there, to which the French teacher replies, that's debatable. Making the scene even funnier is that the French teacher is played by Thomas Le Marquis' father, Gerard Le Marquis, a French immigrant to Iceland. Noi treats the psychiatrist played by Haraldur Jonsson with Noi's typical irreverence, and the psychiatrist responds by giving up the standard questions and just giving Noi an IQ test to fill out. Despite Noi's lack of interest in school, however, he seems to be highly intelligent. He solves a Rubik's Cube in a matter of seconds, easily wins at the memory game of Mastermind, and scores in the genius level on the IQ test. He's also fascinated by nature, animals, and the world around him, and he maintains a few friendships. He's somewhat mischievous, rigging the slot machine at the gas station and using his fraudulent winnings to buy malts, but he never harasses nor physically harms anyone. One day, Noi is pleasantly surprised to see a beautiful young girl about his age working at the gas station. Her name is Iris, played by Ellen, Honsta Ellen Honsdotter. He's instantly attracted to her, and when he orders a malt, she asks if he's going to drink it there. He asks if she wants him to drink it there, and she says that she doesn't care. She goes on to explain that it'll cost less if he leaves the empty bottle there, and he responds by asking if that's the only reason she asked, apparently hoping that she wanted him to drink it there out of interest in him. 
but she's annoyed by his implication and asks if he's retarded. Shortly afterward, Noi visits the local bookstore, which is in the house of his middle-aged friend Oscar, played by Yalti Roggenwaldsen. In an early scene, Oscar reads a long section of Soren Kierkegaard's Either Or, then throws it in the trash, dismissing the book as garbage. In this scene, Oscar and Noi play mastermind, and Oscar rewards Noi's victory by giving him two pornographic magazines. It's never revealed what Noi would have given Oscar had Oscar won. Noi then asks Oscar if he's seen the new girl at the gas station, obviously being very interested in her, but, o but Oscar says that Iris or Iris is his daughter and sternly warns Noi to stay away from her. Oscar apparently thinks that Noi is good to have around for guy activities, but that his morals are too low to be a good boyfriend for Iris. Part of Noi's problem seems to be that he's, that he's in a location that doesn't have enough intellectual stimulation, and he passes time with activities such as watching TV, shooting icicles with his rifle, and spending time alone in his cellar, the latter of which turns out to be a bigger plot element than it initially seems. And though Noi is never shown playing basketball, an outdoor basketball goal is actually shown in an early uh, scene of random shots of the town. That was a great surprise to me as basketball is not a major sport in Iceland. And being, you know, from Indiana where basketball is, is king or at least was for many years until football took over, I think it's, you know, uh, particularly great to see. And uh, it should be noted, however, that back in the 80s there was a mildly productive NBA player by the name of Peter Gudmundsson who I think think was the first European ever to play in the NBA, and I believe that he's the only Icelandic to this day ever to play in the league. Um, but anyway, uh, Lena, Noi's grandmother, seems to have an even less exciting life than Noi does. Lena spends her time listening to the shipping news on the radio. Um, she also uh, spends a lot of time putting together large jigsaw puzzles and learning a dance on TV or radio. You can't see which device she's listening to it on. So, Anyway, she and Noi have a cordial relationship even though she seems to have little understanding of him. Noi and Kitty, however, don't get along as well. Kitty clearly loves his son but is not equipped to be a good father to him. Kitty also does not set a good example both with his alcoholism and his attitude toward women. In an early scene, Kitty tells Noi to go up to a girl and ask if she's put on weight. Kitty assures Noi that the girl won't leave him alone until they've had sex. But Noi continues to pursue Iris and she slowly warms to him. Their relationship is far from a typical Hollywood romance, but as I said in both the Heaven Help Us episode and some of the Rocky episodes, my favorite romances in film tend to be those that are realistic. Noi and Iris's romance is awkward and unglamorous, as new romances often are, especially among teenagers. Noi teaches Iris how to smoke, and the two break into the local museum where they kiss for the first time. However, it's not merely a makeout session. The couple also looks at a world map and talks about running away together. That underscores one of the movie's most prominent themes, which is Noi's interest in exploring the world. As a birthday present, Lena gives Noi a viewmaster through which he views different parts of the world with great fascination, particularly a beach in Cuba and on a few occasions during the film, tropical ethnic music is played. Oscar is initially angry about Noise and Iris' romance. When he walks into the gas station and sees them sitting, sitting together, he doesn't say a word, but he looks furious. In response, Noi gets up and leaves while Iris gets back to work. Eventually, however, Oscar comes to grudgingly accept the relationship. Getting back to the museum scene, as Noi attempts to pick the lock, Iris becomes so desperate to escape from the cold, she throws a rock through the window. That strikes me as being out of character for her, but it seems oddly appropriate as this movie is a little quirky. One night, while Kitty is suffering from a bad toothache, Noi takes his father's shift and discovers a mini tape recorder in the taxi. He gives the tape recorder to his classmate, to his classmate David, played by Griper Gieslason, and asks him to record Alfred's class the next day. While Noi, while Noi is home, Leisurely making a pancake, Alfred is furious that Noi is attempting to use the tape recorder as a substitute for attending class. Alfred goes to Torin and threatens to resign if Noi isn't expelled. Torin bows to the pressure, expelling Noi and telling him that teachers are threatening to resign and that the school can't afford to lose any more staff. Noi, saying his father will go crazy, asks for one more chance, but Torin denies it. 
Noe's final plea expresses great insight into human nature, as even kids who don't have good relationships with their fathers nevertheless have an inherent desire to make their fathers proud. Later that day, Kitty is playing an out-of-tune piano, becomes frustrated by its bad sound, then goes into a rage destroying the piano with an axe. It's a scene that, as a musician, is very painful for me to watch. Noe arrives shortly afterward, and Kitty pleads with his son, don't throw it all away like I did. Noe informs, Noe informs Kitty of the expulsion. Kitty initially thinks Noe is joking, but upon realizing that he's serious, Kitty asks Noe, how could you do this to me? Noe responds by saying, relax, they didn't expel you. Kitty, Kitty then goes into another rage, grabbing Noe in a headlock, continuing to squeeze more tightly and asking him if he surrenders. Noe says, first the, Noe says no the first two times, but yes the third time. Kitty then immediately calms down, apologizes, invites him out to dinner, and asks him for a hug, which Noe gives meekly and reluctantly. At the restaurant, Kitty and Noe eat in the dining room, then go to the bar. Noe asks for a beer, but is denied as he has no ID, and to the no-nonsense bartender played by Osmunder, Osmudson says he never serves alcohol to customers under 20. So Kitty orders a lemonade, then asks for a straw with it. The bartender gives Noe an orange straw, but he requests a yellow one and gets it. I have no idea if Noe was just trying to be difficult, or if for some reason he actually preferred a yellow straw. Kitty then asks for um, the karaoke list and selects the Elvis Presley classic in the ghetto. Kitty is apparently a big Elvis fan as Kitty's cat is actually named not merely Elvis but El Elvis Aaron. In case you don't know, um, Elvis Presley's middle name was Aaron. But anyway, while Kitty is singing, Noi begins to mix his lemonade with some alcohol that he's brought into the restaurant by himself but he's caught by the bartender who forcibly pulls Noi to an exit and shoves him out into a pile of snow. Rather than try to get the attention of Kitty, who's still singing, Noi walks to Iris's house and tries to get her attention by throwing a snowball at her window, which actually worked earlier in the movie. It doesn't work this time, however, so he shouts to her, which also doesn't work. He then climbs onto the roof of the three-story house, but is caught by Oscar. The two go inside and have a civil conversation, but Oscar still expresses disapproval of Noi's romance with of Oscar still expresses approval of Noi's romance with Iris. Oscar says his daughter deserves better than a wimp with a bloody nose, adding that Noi is a good kid, but not exactly a prince on a white horse. Iris enters the room shortly afterward and suggests that because it's so late and cold outside, Noi spend the night there and sleep on the couch, which Oscar um reluctantly accepts after some prodding from his daughter. Lena goes to an auto mechanic named Gilfi, played by Shartan Bjargmansson, who also does fortune telling on the side. It's, it's an interesting mix, uh, auto mechanics and fortune telling. Lena explains that Noi was recently expelled, is not the academic type, and that a fortune telling could, uh, could move Noi toward a career. Gilfi initially says he's too busy, but Lena talks him into it. Meanwhile, Kitty gets Noi a job working in a cemetery for a Lutheran minister played by Peter Einarsson. Noi performs so ineptly he tries the compassionate minister's patience. And when the minister asks Noi to dig a 300 centimeter grave that's about 10 feet, Noi says he can't dig 300 centimeters in the frost and manages to negotiate his way down to 230 centimeters. Noi tells Iris about his impending fortune reading but Iris dismisses fortune tellers, saying they're always giving the same generic predictions. However, while giving Noi's fortune, Yulfi becomes horrified, saying he sees nothing but death. Noi responds by saying, what kind of a lame-brained are you, and leaving. In the next scene, Noi is digging a grave, and then seems to be struck with a sudden sense of urgency to pursue his dreams. He goes to his bank with a rifle and attempts a robbery. The, tel the teller, played by Ostis Torodsen, thinks it's a prank, and she isn't the least bit shaken. The bank manager, played by Paul Lofsen, enters the room and is revealed to be David's father, um, David being Noy's classmate who brought the tape recorder into the, into the school for Noy. The manager takes the rifle from Noy, telling him he's, uh, that you know he shouldn't play with guns and that he's old enough to know better, then hands the gun to a customer and shoves Noy out the door. It's a funny scene for me to watch as an American, as I've never heard of a bank rob robbery in this country being stopped in that manner. Um, all these bank robberies over here end with uh, the police being called, and often with some sort of violent showdown. 
Noe re-enters the bank a few seconds later and withdraws all of his money. He then goes to a formal bar store at which classic music is playing. The salesperson, played by Otar Propa, has a very easy time as Noe acts like a typical Christmas Eve shopper, one who comes to buy, not merely to look. Now dressed in his expensive new suit, Noe breaks into a car, hot wires it, and drives to the gas station. Iris is on duty, and Noe walks in enthusiastically, inviting her to run away with him. However, Iris just stares at him, looking confused. He, he dejectedly leaves, and almost immediately hears police sirens. As he tries to get away, the car he's driving becomes stuck in the snow. He runs into an empty construction vehicle, gets into the driver's seat, but is arrested within a few seconds. Kitty gets Noy out of jail, and the two say nothing to each other. On the way back to Noy's house, they stop at a gas station, and Kitty asks Iris, who's pumping gas, if she's put on weight, apparently not realizing that she's Noy's girlfriend. Noy is embarrassed, and Iris looks at him, but the two don't speak to each other. I won't give any more specific details about the plot, as they're crucial to the climax, but I will say that uh, Yelvi's prediction does come true, and I think the message of the movie is that even when a loss is tragic, it can be liberating, that sometimes we cling to things, and doing so keeps us from being adventurous and pursuing our dreams. And I'll also add a comment about the climax um, that I read, I think, on the IMDb message board. According to the comment, according to the comment in the Icelandic translation of the Bible, Noi is the name of the character who in English we call Noah, and based on their similar fates, Kari might be drawing a parallel between the two characters. And also, um, I mentioned Petru Einarsson as the priest. He also has a very uh, gentle and uh, sensitive scene that he handles very well um, right after the climax. At the time I first saw this movie, I knew uh, a film... At the time I first saw this movie, I knew that a film scene existed apart from the major Hollywood studios, but I hadn't paid much attention to it, even though my brother, Robert McAtee, had already been acting in Hollywood movies um, and TV shows for six years. I loved this movie so much from the start, I instantly wanted to start exploring more indies, including from Europe. And a few weeks later, my brother emailed me an early draft of a screenplay for his mystery drama movie, Trail of Crumbs, which ended up being released in 2008, and which ironically seems to make a, a similar point about the liberation that can come out of loss. The combination of seeing Noi and reading the Trail of Crumbs screenplay resulted in my decision to pursue a career in film, even though I was already 34, and I now wish I'd started in the field much younger, so I'm trying to make up for lost time now. I've acted in 56 films now, and hopefully that's just the beginning. Now, Noi is not a movie to watch for special effects or anything glamorous, but if writing and acting are the two most important aspects of a film for you as they are for me, this movie is a must-see. Being that Iceland has a population of only 300,000, I figured there wouldn't be a lot of good actors there, but much to my pleasant surprise, the acting in this movie is great from top to bottom and much of the cast have long IMDb profiles, some of which also include non-Icelandic films. But while it's not at all an adventurous pick, the game ball must go to Tomas Le Marquis, who's sensational as Noi. His very distinct appearance made him a natural choice for the role, and in addition to that, he nails his performance, making the character a fascinating enigma. We see enough to know that he's extremely intelligent and has a lot of interests, and we even see a few signs that he's sensitive, particularly near the end when he learns of some deaths of people close to him. But we never fully learn what motivates him, or why he's completely disinterested in school. Turster Leo Gunnarsson also is a particular standout as Kitty, providing both some of the movie's ugliest and most poignant mo moments. And another random observation, in one scene, Kitty is wearing a shirt of the heavy metal music group Iron Maiden. I don't know if Kitty is supposed to be a fan of the group or not. And despite the lack of technical resources, writer-director Dagur Kari used a lot of creativity in the way he made the movie, underscoring the bleakness of a winter in a small town in Iceland. For example, during most of the movie, the color is dull and the audio is in mono, while the music by Kari's alternative rock group, um, Slow Blow, is dark and modestly produced. And though the movie doesn't mention this fact, possibly assuming that most people watching the movie will be Icelandic and therefore already know it. Iceland has only about four hours of 
daylight per day during the darkest period of the year. I've never been to Iceland at all, but I have been to southern Norway, including in December when they only have about seven hours of daylight, and that's depressing enough. I can only imagine what it's like to have even less daylight. And by the way, in the far south of Norway, um, they go through, uh, excuse me, in the far north of Norway, they go through several weeks a year with no daylight at all. And to top it off, this movie is full of Iceland's natural beauty and, architecture, and architectural charm. I already wanted to visit the country, and I'm even more interested in doing so because of this movie. And I was also pleasantly surprised that in an early collage of shots of uh, Noise Town, um, as I said earlier, they showed that outdoor basketball goal. And so I guess that's uh, an example of architectural charm as, as well for, for me being, being a uh, Hoosier that is someone from Indiana. And it should be noted also, while I'd never seen um, a, I, I don't recall seeing before this a full-length uh, European movie, I did see an Icelandic uh, short or t TV episode on Norwegian television back in the year 2000. Um, um, my girlfriend at the time was from Norway, and she and I were um, watching it over there one night, and we thought it was very, very bad. Um, I didn't understand any of it because the subtitles were in Norwegian rather than English, but it seemed to be about a guy trying to Im impress a girl by shooting a tin can off of a tree stump and failing miserably at it and, you know, um, basically being a, a clutch the whole movie. So um, I, I've looked on IMDb at every Icelandic production on there and I haven't seen anything that seems to be that uh, film in question, so I hope to find it someday just to, to watch it, you know, for a few laughs. But anyway, um, fortunately, Noi is easy to get a copy of. It's available on DVD here in America, on Amazon, or other sites, often for under $10. The um, DVD also includes a 19-minute documentary on the making of the movie, largely comprised of an interview with writer-director Dagur Kari, uh, in which he gives a lot of interesting information on the making of this movie and filmmaking in general. My brother told me that having a low budget induces creativity, and Dagur seems to share that philosophy. He used his mind to overcome many of the constraints of this movie's slow budget. Um, also included on the DVD are three deleted scenes. In the first, the psychologist in first, in the first uh, deleted scene, the psychiatrist informs Torin that Noi is a genius, much to Torin's shock. Now, in the aforementioned scene in which Alfred goes to Torin and demands that Noi be expelled, Torin tells Alfred that the psychiatrist said Noi is a genius. So overall, the deleted scene isn't totally necessary, but I wish it had been included as it shows Torin as being concerned about Noi and wanting to help him, which comes across far less in the final cut. Dagur said the scene was deleted so it wouldn't be clear whether Noi is a genius or not, but I think that the final cut clearly establishes that he was. Um, the second deleted scene depicts Noi drinking alcohol while driving his father's taxi. Um, he's stopped by the police for suspicion of drunk driving. Noi exploits the letter of the law to delay the testing process. He first demands that a second police officer be present for the, for the administration of the sobriety test. While waiting for the second officer to show up, um, the officer at the scene allows Noi to leave the car supposedly to urinate, but Noi actually does push-ups and eats snow. Then the second officer shows up. Noi blows into a bag and fails the test. He disputes the results, so the officers take him to the police station for a blood test. While waiting for the doctor to show up, Noi drinks water in the bathroom. The doctor shows up and then Noi demands to see the doctor's medical license, which the doctor doesn't have with him. So the doctor leaves to get his license while Noi does more push-ups. Then the doctor returns with his license, administers the blood test, and by that time Noi is no longer legally drunk and therefore not charged. It's a good scene, but it's nine minutes long, and, you know, the, and, and it would have been a distraction from the overall story. Um, Dagur said in his introduction the same thing I just did, you know, as far as reason as his reason uh, for not including it, adding that the scene is like a short within a feature. So I was glad to see that Dugger and I are yeah, 
in sync at least on that issue as for um, why the scene should have been deleted. By the way, it's an 88 minute movie, so I mean, the, the, this scene is roughly a tenth of the, the length of the whole movie. And um, finally, the third deleted scene is an oddity. Noise seems to hear an unusual sound. I guess it hadn't been dubbed in yet because I didn't hear anything, but he calls for his grandmother and then walks into her room where he opens a closet and sees Lena standing there with her violin. She explains that his grandfather wants it that way as he hates the sound of violins. Noi tries to comfort his grandmother while reminding her that Grandpa died many years ago. Now, I don't get the scene, and I think it's best that it wasn't included in the final cut, and unlike the other two deleted scenes, Dougler gave no introduction to this one. And finally, the bonus materials are... Um, rounded out by the American theatrical trailer. In addition, a soundtrack album for the movie is available, which is very unusual. In fact, I'd say extremely unusual for a non-major studio release. And the soundtrack is performed, as alluded to earlier, by uh, Duggar's rock group, uh, Slow Blow, which is real. They sound to me like, really, they sound to me like an alternative garage band. Um, they apparently have done several albums, although I haven't heard any of their music under uh, other than in this movie, and I don't know if they're um, available outside of Iceland or not. I think that the noise soundtrack is available on iTunes at least. But anyway, that's Slow Blow, spelled like it sounds, but as one word. And by the way, for the sake of clarification, as I've generally referred to Dagur Kari by his first name, Iceland is on a patronymic naming system. For example, rather than pass last names down from generation to generation, most Icelandics take their father's first name, followed by S, putting that name into the possessive case, and then adding um, son, or just son or daughter. For example, if your first name is Bjorn and you have a son named Sorin, he would be Sorin Bjornsson. And if you had a daughter named Inga, she would be Inga, um, Inga Bjorn's daughter under that system people are properly referred to by their first names. However, an exception to that rule being uh, Thomas Le Marquis, as I mentioned his father is a uh, French immigrant. Uh, Gerard Le Marquis plays the French teacher in this movie. Um, and Thomas obviously carries his father's last name. So, in conclusion, this is a movie that I recommend very highly. It's interesting and quirky throughout and it's alternately funny, sad, and depressing while providing a few vague moments of hope. It's only 88 minutes long, it's in Icelandic with English subtitles, and it's a great way to introduce people to the vast and enriching world of independent and international cinema. And very deservedly, it's been shown at dozens of film festivals around the world, and it's won many awards. It currently has a 7.4 rating on IMDb, and I give it a 10 out of 10. Like I said at the top of the episode, this movie literally changed my life. Had I never seen it and never gone into film, I have no idea what I'd be doing right now. But now that I'm working in film, I never want to be aw I never want to be away from it. So to Dagur Kari and the rest of the cast and crew, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, this concludes episode 11. Feel free to share this video, to like Super Deep Movie Analysis on Facebook, and to email me and or befriend me at my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash lexzorn. That's facebook.com slash l-e-c-z-o-r-n. As always, thank you so much for joining me, and I cordially invite you to do so again in the near future for episode 12. Until then, for Super Deep Movie Analysis, this is Lex Zorn. Good night.